Thank you, and thank you for joining us at Sessions today. I'm going to talk about how Stripe builds APIs and Teams. So 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. And when NASA wrote the original engineering requirements for the Apollo mission, it didn't even mention the word software. In his book, Digital Apollo, MIT aeronautics professor David Mendel wrote, software was not included in the schedule, and it was not included in the budget. But as you may know, software ended up being critical to the Apollo mission, running the ignition sequence, the automatic maneuvers, and the onboard controls on the spacecraft. In fact, you can find the Apollo guidance computer source code on GitHub. Margaret Hamilton joined the program in 1961 to develop software for the Apollo guidance computer. And in 1965, she became the team lead, later coining the term software engineering. And by 1968, over 400 people were writing software for the Apollo program. Software was going to help get the US to the moon. But there was no existing framework of software development philosophy to rely on. This was the first real software engineering team cobbled together from a sprawling army of MIT personnel, NASA engineers, and private contractors. With so many software engineers, NASA and MIT quickly found that their biggest challenges were actually organizational. They had to manage communication problems, train new hires, devise unit and integration tests, and they ultimately designed their code base as a series of independent modules so work could proceed in parallel. And then a set of central committees managed the design and development process, and each module was verified independently before launch with a flight readiness review. There was little margin for error, and real world impact to human lives for every decision the Apollo team made. The code was prepared for launch on a series of punch cards, and it was hardwired into a form of read-only memory called core rope memory, using these little tiny ferromagnetic cores, a fine wire thread where a one bit was stored by threading the wire through a core, while a wire bypassed the core for a zero bit. And that design was resistant to radiation in space, and it could store about 1,500 bits per cubic inch. The software was literally woven into the memory. And the eight-week production lead time for that meant that any mistake in the code base could throw the whole program off schedule. And I think that sometimes it feels today like legacy business software is still running on core rope memory. The Apollo mission is an incredible snapshot of how hard it is to build software. They had to start quite literally from the ground up and learn all the hard lessons of building infrastructure software with a lofty goal and an extremely compressed timeline. In the decades since, the exponential rise of hardware computing power has significantly raised the stakes. Software could suddenly solve incredibly complex problems, but the same questions that the Apollo team needed to answer suddenly magnified. And I think we've all been relearning those same lessons in the decades since. Which brings us to how we deal with this challenge at Stripe. We build economic infrastructure for millions of businesses around the world, and we expose it via an API platform. And when you operate infrastructure, the decisions you make about how to build software impact everyone who relies on the service. We process more than 250 million API requests every day, deploy more than 4,000 API versions per year, and maintain more than 500 distinct API endpoints. And we do this with a team of more than 800 engineers based all around the world, from Dublin to San Francisco to Singapore. And our API constitutes the building blocks, the common language, and the infrastructure that many businesses rely on. The APIs we produce, then, need to be simple and approachable for a global audience. They need to feel powerful and flexible for developers. And it's really important that they're collectively composable so businesses can design and evolve their operating model through code. So we're thoughtful about our team structures and design practices to enable us to operate in a distributed, autonomous fashion while preserving a consistent API. In this talk, I'm going to focus on a few key principles that we've learned from that experience. And it's really humbling to have the opportunity to share the work of so many people across Stripe today. So let's take a look. 
The most important principle is users first. This lesson, I think, is well learned by the best product and engineering organizations across our industry. Always start with your user. Werner Vogels, Amazon's CTO and one of the chief architects behind AWS, outlined their approach to designing for users in a process he called working backwards, where they create four documents, the press release, the frequently asked questions list, an outline of the customer experience, UI mocks, and the user manual before building any code. Now, as the name suggests, it may seem backwards to start with the user manual and the press release. But armed with these resources, Amazon's teams reliably communicate about new projects and quickly establish a shared vision. And one of the reasons that AWS focused here is because when you build for builders, it's even more important to get all these details right. Developers can spend over a dozen hours a day designing and debugging with your tools. Donald Knuth, author of the legendary tome, The Art of Computer Programming, and the typesetting system tech used by scientists, mathematicians, and engineers around the world, noted, I came to the conclusion that the designer of a new system must not only be the implementer of the first large scale and the first large scale user, the designer should also write the first user manual. The separation of any of these four components would have hurt tech significantly. If I had not participated fully in all these activities, literally hundreds of improvements would never have been made because I would never have thought of them or perceived why they were important. A similar intense focus on users is a core part of our ethos at Stripe. Users first is one of our company's operating principles, and you'll often hear us mention it to each other in conversation. It's also a really critical part of our history. Back when Stripe was a fledgling startup, in a small office in downtown Palo Alto, building out the very first version of the Stripe API, the team sat with prospective users and carefully interviewed them on our API design. It actually took three major redesigns before we shipped the first version. And for an early stage startup company, that is an eternity. But with our focus on developers, we realized it was critical to both get the right semantics and build something that just felt good to use. Engineers wrote the original documentation for every API resource. And in the early days, every API error would trigger an email to John and Patrick's inboxes and every support ticket would page their cell phones. They also often pair programmed these first Stripe integrations together with our first users. And to this day, we maintain the same IRC channel inhabited by some of our earliest users who provide us with key feedback on our APIs. And our most passionate users cement our culture of investing in API design. Today, we need to support a highly diverse global user base in over 45 countries. So we've had to find the right ways to scale our approach to engaging with users. For example, this year, we designed a new set of asynchronous payment APIs to support SCA. And so we sent a team to London to introduce users to these new APIs and the documentation in person and listen to their feedback. <laughs> Writing a press release before starting on the implementation is still a very common practice for product briefs at Stripe. Here's a real example describing new support for paper checks in our billing product. And doing this at the beginning really helped us align on what we were really trying to do with the product. We also gather feedback directly from our API documentation and the developer view in our dashboard with both a CSAT metric and these free form comments that you can see on screen. And every one of these is reviewed by our developer experience teams and funneled directly to product development teams. In fact, we find that our best products often emerge from this ongoing conversation with our users. After seeing many users follow an extract transform load pattern with Stripe data to produce their own custom reporting, we created Sigma to allow users to rapidly query their, their Stripe data set using the common SQL interface. We have multiple teams across the company continuously talking to and learning from our users including our UX research teams, product managers, deployment teams, support engineers, and developer experience teams. In fact, the truth is we encourage everyone within Stripe to talk to our users in whatever capacity they operate. And Sessions is a big part of that. Thank you for being here to engage in the conversation. 
And from these conversations, we maintain ongoing lists of the top asks from businesses of all sizes and across geographies to provide a total view on how our platform needs to evolve. As an infrastructure company, the foundation of our roadmap is built on seeing patterns of need across these conversations with users. The next principle is that you just have to spend time making it good. I like to bake sardo on the weekends. This is actually one of my loaves. I'm quite proud of it. And when I do this, the ingredients are exactly the same every time. Flour, water, salt, and yeast. But you should have seen my first attempts. They were disastrous. But as I've taken time to perfect my recipe and the technique, the bread became kind of special. It's a labor of love, and it just takes time. I've been feeding the starter for my sardo for more than a year. And every time I bake a loaf, it gets a little bit better. I've learned from my mistakes. More water, less salt, more time to prove, need harder, need lighter. And believe it or not, I think API design is like this too. Every small decision cumulatively makes the difference. We have teams dedicated to reviewing our developer experience and improving the frontline tools they work with every day. Client libraries in multiple languages, and an API reference, both of which we auto-generate directly from our source code, so they're always accurate. Or the new command line tool that you heard about earlier today. Those are just a few of the developer touch points that we pay a lot of attention to. And fortunately, externally, the Stripe API is often perceived as being deeply consistent and polished. And people often ask me, what's the secret behind your approach? Well, the simple truth is, there is no secret. I think there's no way around this law of physics and API design. You have to put in time to making using an API delightful. And that means a lot of engineers who understand our users need to be involved at all stages of the development lifecycle of our API. It's important to infuse a culture of great API design at multiple levels of a product and engineering organization. And over time, we've settled on a few key properties that capture our approach towards API design. First, simplicity. Very top-level API resources should be easy to understand, and they should map to real-life concepts in a way that feels intuitive. That makes them feel tactile for the developer and makes it easier to understand how to use them. APIs also need to be composable. They should be additive. Building blocks should fit together. Our goal is that any component of the platform will work predictably with every other component. Whenever there's an edge, we apply effort to smooth it out. And as you use more of Stripe's API, you gain a cumulative advantage. For example, we find that users start with our Connect API and then steadily add billing, then Terminal, then Sigma as their business evolves and they seek to unlock new functionality. Next is predictable. APIs are infrastructure. When you turn on the tap at home, you expect that water comes out. So when you perform an operation multiple times and under multiple conditions, you should expect the same outcome. And we provide idempotent operations so users can safely rerun transactions without worrying about accidentally duplicating charges. Each of these design principles enables Stripe businesses to reliably integrate with any number of our APIs, operate them at scale, and maintain them over time with a minimum of effort. Finally, APIs should be backwards compatible by design. You can continue transacting on Stripe using your existing technical integration, even as we add new features and evolve our design. You can then choose when to upgrade your infrastructure when you're ready. So those are the principles. How do we make sure that they come to life? Well, we have a rigorous API design process that allows any team to follow them while independently designing new products and API interfaces. I'd like to share the process we follow when building a new API today. We start with a design document that proposes a new API specification. It details any new endpoints, API resources, events, or changes to responses, parameters, or webhook behavior. Then we have a cross-functional review team with expertise in our platform operations, our developer experience, our front-end tooling, security practices, and other areas across Stripe. And that group meets in person to discuss questions like, are these changes consistent with the design patterns we have across our API? 
Will the experience feel consistent when using different programming languages with the client libraries of Stripe? How will this look and feel to someone outside of Stripe? How might this break user expectations? How might this change affect APIs that layer on top of the proposal? What's the friction for an existing or new user to adopt the API? Are we introducing severe technical burden if you're migrating to it? We then conduct user testing to learn about how real users might adopt the new features and what tensions might come up. And then we produce an early version. And we use infrastructure in our systems to gate in the specific users to provide as much early feedback as possible on what is a real working API that we haven't yet shipped to all of our users. Our team irons out any bugs, documents the new feature, and issues a new API version. And when we're ready to go live, we incrementally roll out the feature to users across the platform and keep a close eye for issues as they come up. So the key to this process is that we've introduced as many opportunities as possible for feedback from experts across the company and from users to avoid building our products in isolation from our user base. One of the most important opportunities for expert feedback in that flow is our Stripe API review. This team of engineers encourages a culture of great API design. And over the years, they've arrived at a set of encouraged design patterns. So I'm going to share just a few of them today drawn from the concrete checklists and guidelines that we use internally. Here's a good one. Avoid industry jargon. Our users shouldn't need to be experts in payments. Stripe should provide familiar tactile parameter names. For instance, every credit card has that long number across the front. It's known as the primary account number, or PAN, in industry parlance. But on our API, we say card.number and not card.pan, because everyone understands number, but only insiders understand what a PAN is. And some of these examples get really, really detailed. Uh, for instance, we use nested structures to group related concepts rather than flattening them all to the top level. And we find over time that that improves understanding and enables future extensibility. More details. Properties in the API are preferred as enums rather than Booleans. We find that we can't predict all the possible future states for a property. And here you can see an example from issuing. If we'd chosen to make canceled a Boolean to denote whether it was an active or canceled state of a card, we couldn't have added the inactive state that we later realized we would need to. If an API request affects an object's state, that change should be reflected in the response. As an example, you can see that the request here is modifying this customer's description to hello. So it's really important that hello is reflected in the response so you know when calling the API that your request was successful and it did what you expected. We also have consistent patterns for polymorphic APIs. Sometimes APIs like this can return multiple types of objects, but we still want to provide one generalized API. So we can include a polymorphic response for each type. Polymorphism in APIs is notoriously difficult to get right. The best pattern we've arrived at for developers is to rely on a type field to easily disambiguate what object you're going to be receiving and then provide parameters unique to that type of object in a designated nested structure. Side effects and meaningful changes should be expressed through verbs. When you're substantially modifying a core API resource, an explicit verb makes it much easier to understand that there's actually a state change behind the scenes. So in the first case here, you can see this request is actually capturing a payment. And the second one is marking uncollectible an invoice. And that leads on to a really neat pattern uh, for timestamps. Related to those changes, any such timestamps should be expressed as verbed at. Finally, API review explicitly encourages providing early access to rapidly iterate on designs with beta users. A critical part of our infrastructure is a system of software gates that unlock new functionality on our platform. And this enables us to invite external users to try a new feature before it's released to the general Stripe user base. Teams are encouraged to trial a few designs with users to settle on the best option. The issuing API, for instance, was developed behind a gate for over a year. And the new identity verification product that you saw during the keynote is available to a limited number of users today behind a similar gate. 
It's also really important to remove these gates aggressively once the feature has actually shipped. You don't want to be maintaining multiple code paths for very long. What may seem like small details are, in aggregate, highly impactful. Of course, no one of these is a hard and fast rule. There can often be good reasons to make an exception. And the API review team at Stripe holds in-person discussions specifically to examine the spaces in between and identify the right solution for users. Anytime we're in doubt, we try to let the developer experience drive us and not how easy it is for us to implement. And we don't always get it right. We don't always pick the right design the first time around. We ultimately still learn the most from your feedback. For example, we introduced an API named Issuer Fraud Records, and we were really, really excited about it. We were going to provide fraud warnings based on reports from card networks, enabling users to identify potentially fraudulent purchases before they resulted in a dispute with additional fees. But early feedback from a small set of invited users showed that the name was really confusing to them. In fact, the only Google search results for the term issuer fraud record are from Stripe documentation pages. So our product team took a step back, and they brainstormed some new options and renamed this to the Early Fraud Warning API, which much more closely captured the essence of what the functionality provided. That's just one example of why an essential challenge in API design is naming. Each Stripe API resource should have an easy to understand name for a global audience, like customers, payment methods, and disputes. We're obsessive about naming. Literally, these are some of the most passionate conversations I've ever been in at Stripe. And it's not just that the names need to make sense, but that users are going to need to type them over and over again. And every time they do so, that acts as a touch point with Stripe. Names have long lives. You can look to the basic Unix commands that still live at the core of Mac OS and Linux servers with arcane names like RM, MV, or CP. But why on earth are they so cryptic? Well, one of the original Unix pioneers, Hendrik Thomason, explained that in the days of Unix mainframes, you would log in on thin clients, and you were charged for both CPU and network time you used. So characters were at a premium. And he also said the keys required a really hard hit. So if you were working the whole day, you'd really feel it in your knuckles. And that's the reason why the Unix command repertoire has these very short names. If you can save one typing keystroke per command, that really helps. And we're still using Hendrix commands today. So we take this very seriously. We expect that the names we choose will live on in software systems for a very long time. We also spend a lot of time building with our own APIs to experience any pain points firsthand ourselves. When I talk with interview candidates, one of the basic questions I'm curious to answer about their current role is, what are you building? And you know, it's actually surprising how many organizations operate in a way that's divorced from the product that they build for their users. Microsoft manager Paul Maritz coined the term dogfooding inspired by Alpo Dog Food, whose spokesperson famously explained that their product was so good, his own dogs loved and ate Alpo every day. At Microsoft, Maritz insisted that all their employees adopt the Microsoft Land Manager product so they could understand firsthand how it should be improved. And the, the idea of dog fooding caught on at Microsoft and then later throughout our industry. And we regularly dog food our APIs and developer tools at Stripe we build practical examples ourselves, often early in a product's development cycle. Before we launch a new product, we'll hold an internal hackathon to encourage open testing and feedback on the new API. We also produce focused reviews of particular APIs or products and ask teams to write up what we call a developer experience friction log. It's a snappy name. The goal is to produce a log of every single command that you run and your personal reactions along the way noting things like, I find this section of documentation really confusing, or I was frustrated, frustrated by the number of steps this took. And that helps identify the sharp edges in experience that a typical bug report just doesn't capture. Many Stripes also run a side project or a family business on our platform. And we encourage this because it provides us with even more first-hand experiences using our tools and platform. 
Here are a few examples. One of our engineers, Johnny Hallman, manages Cushion, which helps freelancers manage their clients, invoices, and projects. And they use billing for invoices, Sigma for analytics, and Atlas for the incorporation. And Barry Padgett, our chief revenue officer, also runs a horse farm called Coru Equestrian, who board, train, and provide a clinic for horses in northern Washington. And they use billing for invoices. Finally, at Stripe, we love to get creative with our emoji. And I created hotdogpins.com to sell custom pins with all of our favorites, like this skiing hot dog. Now, I actually have some revenue goals for hotdogpins.com. So if all of you would like to head on over there after the talk, you'll find that these are really top quality pins. <laughs> and that brings us to our final principle. Design your organization. When we look back at the Apollo mission, one of the emergent properties they discovered was the importance of setting a clear vision and building effective organizational structures against that. One of the mythic stories in that era is from JFK's first visit to NASA headquarters back in 1961. As the story goes, he noticed a janitor carrying a broom, and he interrupted his tour, walked over to the man, and asked, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? Well, Mr. President, the janitor responded, I'm helping put a man on the moon. However, it was actually significantly harder to establish that shared vision across the sprawling army of NASA personnel, MIT scientists, and contractors working on the software. So they designed new organizational structures. In the final report of the Apollo Guidance Software Task Force, NASA concluded the difficulties in software development will continue to require top-level management attention. Software complexity requires a high level of communication and participation by the many organizations involved. In that process, NASA uncovered what is now well known as an emergent property of software engineering as an organization. In 1967, computer scientist and hacker Mel Conway authored what has become known as Conway's Law, summarizing the same lesson that NASA learned. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. And this especially holds true for software. As we've steadily replaced our physical world with software systems, we can learn a lot about why software works a certain way by examining the organizations that create it. As a basic example, if five teams work on a software system, there will tend to be five separate software components. But Conway's law has an inverse corollary. You can be intentional about how you build a software engineering organization, knowing that it will be reflected in the work you produce. When you take a look at a map of Stripe's products, you can observe something else. Spoiler alert, this isn't just a map of products. This is also our org chart internally. Internally, we have payments infrastructure and foundation groups building the global payments and treasury network whose work then supports multiple product groups for everything you see that runs on the top of this stack. Stripe is also a global engineering organization. And because of our scale, it's important to build cultural and communication systems that support quickly building new APIs in a distributed and parallel fashion. The constellation of API design principles enable us to support millions of internet businesses of all shapes and sizes. Every company out there is unique, but by providing the right building blocks, we hope to help them shape how they build their organizations, how they communicate, and in turn, how they build software. The lessons we've learned don't just apply to API platforms. I think that all engineering teams can study their own practices to better understand exactly how to build their products. Here's a few things you might like to try with your own team. Build for your users today, but consider your platform of tomorrow. Interview users carefully, consider patterns of feedback as your North Star, but remember that every new feature that, you'll need to, so that you add, you'll need to support for a long time. Build for builders. The best APIs are building blocks that creators can use predictably to design a solution to their own unique needs. APIs are infrastructure. You can't always predict how your users will build on your APIs, but your most novel products will surely emerge 
from enabling their creativity. And finally, design your organization and your communication structures to support your products. You can influence your product's quality and design by changing how your team communicates and organizes itself. So these are the lessons that we've learned along the way. Please catch me after this talk to share what you've learned. Thank you.